Uh, Rob Page from the International Development Select Committee. Uh, the question for Sam, um, you mentioned land tenure. Um, it's an issue that we've been doing some work on as well. And I think this question may be slightly outside your remit, but nevertheless, I'm interested to work out what you think the blockages are which have prevented um, further progress being made on land tenure over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and perhaps by extension, what you think actors like DFID or other donors can do to um, encourage further action and support governments uh, as they try to make more progress in that, in that area. Thank you. We'll take uh, two or three more. Kate? Thanks. Is that on? Um, thanks. So many questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, there seem to be a lot of implications. Sorry, can you just oh introduce yes, yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Kate Crawford from um, University College London. Uh, there are implications here for um, what money is spent on. Um, are there implications for how much money is spent, if you see what I mean? Slightly different questions. And I ask because of the references to health, because a lot of the opportunities that you mentioned seem to be actually building institutions, and because um, if you make decisions about public health money, um, it's often based on trade-offs between um, not just mortality, but morbidity as well, and the quality of life. And if you think of that in humanitarian action, do you spend quickly on this or slowly on something that will make more of a difference? Thank you. Uh, third question, let me look around the other side of the room. Okay, Sarah? Thank you, it was a re really interesting presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, I'm interested in the limits of response to urban violence. And um, thinking in particular about um, sort of slightly closer to home in Northern Ireland where there is an architecture of violence which is um, created both by peace walls and by the, the symbolism and the importance of um, not least flags as we've seen in the last few months. And just if there are clear humanitarian consequences and a need for a response in such a situation, where are the limits? If we're talking about a country which potentially um, the, the, the state has a responsibility primarily and, and humanitarian organizations will, will supplement that when uh, they can, albeit in a neutral, impartial, independent manner, what are the limits? At what point do you draw a line and what should the exit strategy be when there may be a, um, a static nature to this architecture of violence? Um, and I don't, perhaps I don't have a particular uh, panelist in mind, but just be interested in thoughts on that. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to start with those three and then we'll have another round after that. And that, I think well that works out quite neatly. Sam, I'm going to refer you to the first question. Sure. Um, in, in terms of the lack of progress on on land tenure, I mean, I think it's quite a complex uh, developmental issue, and I'd say it probably is. You're right; it probably is outside my knowledge and area of expertise to really, you know, comment significantly on. I think, for from a more humanitarian perspective, and in terms of uh, the issue, I think it, it's something we need to try and engage with governments on, uh, particularly for national societies, as they have a privileged role, they are auxiliaries to their government in disaster management, and tr start to engage in some of these discussions. So this disaster law program I talked about, hopefully uh, that is starting to address uh, some of the issues in some countries. I know we're doing work in, in Kathmandu on that. Um, I, I think, it, you know, at the end of the day, we're ending up building shelter illegally. Um, as humanitarian agencies. This is not just the Red Cross, this is many humanitarian agencies. So I think this is something at the response side we really need to grapple with. I mean, in terms of how do we address uh, land tenure and land reform issues and urban planning uh, in the longer term, I wouldn't like to pronounce on that because I think it's a highly complex issue that is probably outside my expertise. But I think in terms of what we're doing uh, in, in preparedness, response and recovery, I think we do need to start looking at and I think the Red Cross is in quite a good position given uh, you know the the expertise in international humanitarian law and now starting to think about disaster law as well so um, you know we are we are doing things on that but uh, it's a complex issue okay Francois did you want to yeah, comment yes, on that on that it's, it's interesting because uh, the aid, aid system has been regularly confronted to that challenge including after the tsunami 2005 etc I think one of the reasons we are 
confronted to that challenge is probably because of ourselves, not because of the situation. We have certain paradigm. Uh, we will give a house to someone that can show us uh, a title. Well, in most cities on earth, you have a, a small center where people might have some title and the rest has no title. So either we fix it we, and we know we won't be able to do it, or we find another approach. And there are other approaches available uh, through uh, social control, so, uh, enumeration. There are, there are different types of mechanisms that help us to go on and work with land beyond the, the land title. Mm. We have to be imaginative. And that's where the historical, social, cultural understanding of, of how that city has been created is critical. Most of the time, we don't do this analysis. Then we ask people to show us the, the, land, the land title. Well, the land title of that place might be some uh, in Port Prince, might be somewhere in Miami, and uh, nobody knows where it is because. Mm. And people have been given the right to build a house 300 years ago, and now they are renting a place of someone in that. So, all so we have to to maybe one of the problem is our lands. We saw exactly the same problem for uh, um, debris removal. Debris removal, people wanted to remove debris only in private, in public land, because private would do the thing. It's so complicated to see what is private and public. So the old system got clocked. And uh, so we have to be m uh, very imaginative on this, uh, mm. on this land and, and get beyond the land title. Mm. Imaginative and pragmatic at the same time. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it goes it goes together. Yeah. Okay, um, Elena, would you like to address Kate's question about the money? Yeah, sure. Um, money is uh, definitely an issue for interventions in urban settings. Uh, I remember a few years ago, for example, there was a debate within uh, MSF because, for example. Uh, certain projects like in Honduras for street children exposed to violence or in Rio de Janeiro were somehow as expensive as, as interventions in, in Somalia or Darfur as a whole and there was a real debate on in the house on why would we focus on so you know such expensive programs with the little numbers of population where we could do much more in, in, in other settings. And, and, s and sure enough certain programs have been funded through some innovation funds or other other ways of, uh, of financing, which are whether or not the, the usual institutional or uh, private donors financing that MSF used to use. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the issue of the, of the health system, um, humanitarians, I, I cannot speak for MSF uh, um, anymore now, but uh, there's nothing really much of an ambition of uh, really reestablishing or making a hel an entire health system function. Uh, but rather really focusing on the curative aspects and on the patient. However, uh, in urban settings, it has been seen that it's very important to do a lot of, um, again, as I, I was mentioning, partnering, partnering with the Ministry of Health, doing a lot of training and um, capacity building in order to be able to, at a certain point, to get out and make sure that the, 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 the authorities and the Ministry of Health is able to take over from certain interventions. So it might be something very specific like, uh, for example, uh, uh, establishing a, a proper protocol of care for survivors of sexual violence or secondary health care, surgery. Uh, this is now a bit uh, the trend also in, in uh, response to violence in urban settings, really uh, strengthening the capacity at the secondary level where uh, the surgeries are happening for, for wounded and so on. So it's really, th th as a humanitarian, uh, there's no ambition to, uh, you know, to restore an entire health system, which is certainly a work for someone else, but really to, be, uh, to provide immediate care and in the meanwhile to, uh, to try to make sure that things change, especially through the advocacy as well with, with uh, all the actors that are, and, and the, the, the capacity of referring to other, either public or private, health providers. Thank you. Francois? Yes, um, we, we look at that with a lot of uh, interest in some of our studies because we find that the emerging system is organized that, that with a lot of focus on public health, the dispensaries in the village, and then sometimes there is a, a district hospital where they can do few things. And then you have the, uh, and then when 
you have to refer, to refer, to refer, and maybe the last one is the hospital in the capital or in the cities. This is a classical pyramid of health. The thing is, in the city, everything is compacted. In mm -hmm. the same institution, people will have to do the public health component, the, the classic uh, care curative, and then the surgery and the, uh, the most sophisticated. So it, it compact everything. And not only it compact, but it compact in people's brain because they, it's not anymore that you have to walk three days from that dispensary to the uh, district hospital, and then you have to, uh, one day in the road, bad road to go to this to the capital. Is everything is in ten minutes, and this creates a very specific uh, uh, relation between the population and the compacted uh, health pyramid. Okay, if I can mm -hmm. just, well, uh, I was actually having a discussion on this a few days ago. Uh, people actually go directly to the hospital when there's something. They don't go to the primary yeah. level health care, or maybe there's even even one in the slum. So the the hospitals are really overcrowded, and they cannot cope, particularly with the this secondary level of care with the for people that have injuries or trauma. And so that, that this is where now in certain projects, um, uh, Med Medicine Frontier is trying to shift and work at that level directly because the primary health care is not really what is needed in certain places. Okay, we've got one more question in that round from Sarah about the limits of response to urban violence. Who would like to uh, have a go at that one? Sam? I can say a li little bit. I mean, because, uh, and you mentioned Northern Ireland as well. I mean, that's a, you know, highly contentious situation it has been described as another situation of violence i know icrc is working there um and that's something we're as the british red cross we were looking we have another um uh project looking at our fundamental principles and how we explore them in action and that's something we're starting to reflect more on we're going to look at uh, northern ireland as well we've already looked at somalia and, and lebanon to see how these issues I think when they come closer to home, they seem a bit uh, different. They're framed uh, uh, differently. And I think the capacities to respond are, are different that are non uh, outside what would be seen as the traditional humanitarian sector. So there is, of course, um, limits to what you can do. And I think this taps into a broader question, something we haven't really come onto, but it touched on Eleanor's uh, presentation about you know, when do you choose to intervene in these contexts, that these are chronic contexts, and it's not just uh, context of violence, but context of urban poverty, lack of access to services, uh, low incomes, uh, and so on. And how do you, when do emergency thresholds get tipped over? Uh, and there, how do you leave these contexts? And I think these are open questions, they need to be dealt with uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think that's, and it's also depending on your own capacities as an agency, I mean, different different agencies might want to stay longer, might move into a different mode of, of programming. So, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a complex question. Yeah, I mean, in Group UAD, the D is development, and this is very much uh, related to, to that, to one of the limit. In fact, many of these crisis situations in urban settings, especially acute poverty, malnutrition in, in slums, the, even if they go beyond uh, ab above uh, uh, threshold, there are still development problems. And it's not the humanitarian actors that can really do something. They can put some patches on some of the wounds, but the real problem are development. And of course, it becomes very big. Uh, managing slums in India is managing population which is 10 times bigger than London. Uh, so that's where only the big money of the big development system might and of course, the money of the government mm -hmm. might, might, might do something. And we have to be very, very modest on that. On, on the urban violence, of course, w I think, let's put it that way. Uh, violence in Ireland is still political violence. And political violence clo close to uh, uh, civil war, quote unquote, uh, uh, with a lot of, uh, is something that the aid sector knows how to approach. Where the aid sector is in big difficulties is violence linked to drug cartels, mm -hmm. uh, to those actors who don't give a damn to imagine principles. They don't give a damn to improve the image internationally or nationally. They just don't give a damn. And if they have to cut all the slot of the room because it's good for the agenda, they will do it without any problem. So this is probably our limit because we don't know how to engage with those guys. They don't care about us. 
Sobering thought. Elena. Yeah, very similar to what uh, Francois was saying. Um, yeah, humanitarians, the, the core humanitarian organization, I would say they really, uh, they will put a band-aid on, on a situation, on a crisis situation where there are peak, peaks of, bi of violence, but there's no, again, there's no ambition or no uh, political ambition to resolve or prevent the violence. And um, there are, I uh, uh, we were discussing this issue uh, a few weeks ago in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, th there's a, uh, there really, there needs to be a holistic approach in the and for the reduction of and prevention of violence in urban settings and, and this sort of uh, criminal environment specifically. And, and there needs to be an approach with links uh, human security, law enforcement, uh, urban planning, uh, livelihood hub programs for youth to give them alternatives and cooperation with local communities. Ju functioning judicial system. So this is really, uh, there's nothing, not much there to be done by humanitarians. It's really a big, uh, much bigger issue and it needs to be uh, um, yeah, multidimensional in the approach. Mm. But perhaps humanitarians can help they in leveraging that yeah, kind of sure. support. Um, okay, we, I think we have time for at least one, if not two more rounds of questions. We've got a very quiet online audience of 80 people and so I'd like to encourage you to uh, to email your or send in your, your questions or comments if you have them. I'm going to look over at this side of the room first since uh, we didn't, and Amelia, we'll start with you. Hi there. Um, thanks, everyone. Really interesting uh, presentations. Um, just a question mainly for Francois and Elena. Um, what, what next should we look at? What, what's most urgent in, in preparation for this, this brave new world? Should we map the 20 or 40 or 100 most at-risk cities, which I know people are doing in partnership, but should we be doing more of these Nairobi exercises and understanding dynamics of where election violence could get inflammatory? Um, or are there other things um, that the British Red Cross and other agencies really should be doing urgently? Do you have three or five radical suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more from over here. Yes, this uh, person here. Please identify yourself. Yeah. Hi, uh, Anna Dobai. I'm an independent consultant who spends most of her time doing Red Cross work. Uh, and I have, I'm just wanted really to underline what you said, Wendy, in one of the five principles, which is around this connection with municipalities, and sort of urge, particularly the Red Cross, to look at other parts of the work that you do. I've just finished an evaluation of. Um, uh, HIV programming being done in Latin America and the Caribbean for the last four years. Now, uh, HIV programming isn't primarily in urban areas because they are urban communities primarily. They are also marginalized communities. We're talking about men who have sex with men, commercial sex workers, trans women, etc. They, they suffer extreme violence. And the programs, certainly the programs that I've just been looking at, have they've really developed very good ways of working together with municipalities, with town halls, with uh, civil society organizations, faith-based organizations, at very practical, tangible levels. And I think that there's a lot of learning there to be found. Also with disaster risk reduction programming. I was in, in Colombia last year where the Colombia Red Cross is working and the El Salvador Red Cross, both working at municipal level daily, you know, and I think we can, we should be bridging some of that learning there. Um, and just, well, finally, I, I also do documentary filmmaking, and I'm not going to promote my own, but I, I will afterwards if you want to talk to me about it. But I was watching a film yesterday by Raoul Peck called Assistance Mortelle. I don't know if it's in English. It's on the Arte channel, French channel, but it gives you a very good perspective about the views and positions of the municipality in Port-au-Prince and how they felt about the work that we were all involved with. And I would urge you to, to look at that film. I, it's, it gave me a lot of food for thought. Thank, mm. you. Thank you very much. Um, moving over to this side, this gentleman here in the blue shirt. Thank you. My name is Michael from Nigeria. Um, I'm an independent uh, development practitioner. And my question, um, I must support what uh, Franco said about uh, intervention when it comes to uh, pr um, preventive and corrective measure um, rather than emergency responsiveness because it takes a lot of fund when it comes to that. But I just want to bring out this point because when I was going online and I saw this topic, 
uh, became an interest to me. Because in Nigeria right now, there's this kind of uh, urban reconstruction that leads to um, unemployment of so many people. You know, because in the process of reconstructing um, without having a basic uh, development plan, and you need to now come up with a new baseline to work in an environment, then that kind of uh, buildings are being paved way, and people are going to much of unemployment. So I think uh, much of this humanitarian practice should look into that. You know, a lot of more policymakers want good thing, good development. Because if you take this as an example of a city, this is not a city. Uh, there is nothing you can call a city in this, and we have many of such in all over because there is no plan. So with that, I think we should look more into corrective measures, and starting from the policy, you know. Uh, makers than that, and for the imagined thing of urban reconstruction that's leading to unemployment, we should look into that. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple of more because I think Anna's was more of a comment and information. Here, here in the front row. The um, uh, Kate Crowley from CAFOD. Um, I'm really glad that, Francois, you mentioned the satellite images. Um, we try and link very closely with academics and bring in new thinking and new technologies. Um, but with these new technologies, sometimes require new skills. Um, and I was just wondering, in, in your opinion, and maybe with the, the other panel members, um, do you think that we need to be looking for a new type of humanitarian worker? Um, or do you think maybe that we should be bridging those partnerships uh, with academics, uh, with geoscience ac academics, particularly perhaps, um, so that we can do that preparation work really effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more. This gentleman over here, who's had his hand up since the beginning. Hi. Um, thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Nao, and from University of Oxford. And my question is to Sam. Um, I think you raised the issue of market and livelihoods in urban context. And uh, I would like to know about uh, your methodology. What kind of research tools or methodology have you used to analyze this topic? And what have you found useful so far? Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, I think we're going to start with Amelia's question, which was directed to, I think, Elena and Francois, about priorities. What are those top, maybe not five, because I don't think we have time for those, but those top two or three priorities? Elena? Yeah, very difficult question to answer, I guess. For me, one of the key issues has always been how do you define your entry criteria in this setting? So really, do you want to, do humanitarians want to respond to violence? Are they only going to respond to natural disasters? Uh, what, are, what are the criteria for defining uh, risks and vulnerabilities and wh where is the entry threshold and I think this is a question I mean every organization would maybe answer in a different way but this is a question that is still lingering and, and not it's really unanswered by, by most organizations and then there's the issue for me the priority is really developing the tools to be able to do the, the job properly and um, I remember uh, we did uh, last year a sort of uh, yeah research within within um, MSF, and the key issue was again the needs assessment. Uh, we need to develop proper tools to do this in urban settings. We don't know how to do it that well. Uh, networking strategies. It seems uh, silly, but it's 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 a real job, and then there needs to be appropriate persons with appropriate strategies to be able to do this in in, uh, in such complex environments with with so many actors. And uh, the outreach strategies, uh, how do you reach all the communities and uh, who, who are you going to uh, uh, train to be your messenger in certain places how or, or how to bring uh, health care directly at the door steps of certain vulnerable communities. And uh, linked to that, the referral strategies, how do you choose the organization you can somehow trust for the level of quality of uh, service provision and uh, humanitarian uh, principles, if you want, or neutrality to be able to work and partner with you in certain uh, contexts that are extremely complex. Okay, Francois. Um, Three. Yeah. <laughs> First <laughs> one, skills. And I, I will answer to your question. Let's not reinvent the skills. Uh, you have people who are specialists of uh, pipe in cities. You have mayors. In, 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 uh, we have mayors in our countries. We have people who know how functions a, function a city. So 
It's not to take an average human person and give him the tools that will make <coughs> the difference. It's to try to bring people who have the legitimacy, because one of the key elements in urban setting is legitimacy. You don't bring an human guy, the classical wash person, to talk with the engineer head of the, of the, of the, of the water network. If the guy, after two, two questions, he will know if he has done that once in a city or not, and he will get out of, of the rescue. So critical element, we have to, the aid system has to establish linkage, bridges, with people whose job is to manage those systems in, 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 in cities. That, I think, priority number one. Priority uh, number two, again, it, it's linked to, uh, to skills, but to something very special. Disasters in cities require a type of uh, skills especially during the first few days and, and few weeks, which are not part of the normal human system. Uh, you need people who know how to manage rubbles, uh, civil uh, search and, and, and rescue teams, urban search and rescue teams in particular. With the technology of that is quite, quite, quite sophisticated now. I've done the UNDAC training and I've been the, uh, a member of the UNDAC evaluation. The skills of those guys is enormous. And there are now teams all over the, the place. More and more in those cities, we have uh, what I call the domino effect. You have an, uh, a, a conflict, or you have a, a flood, or you have an earthquake, and immediately you have the chemical factory down. Look at what happened in, in, in Texas uh, two days. I, uh, I spent half of last night in line in telephone with Stephen Woodward, with the uh, deputy uh, administrator of FEMA. And he was explaining, because he's, he's a good friend, and he was explaining all the challenges. And when you enter into those city with those type of disaster, most of our know our classical American aid are obsolete. So we have to, again, see how we do alliance uh, wi with those types. And to, 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 terminate to terminate with two things, as you said earlier, Wendy, most of the information is available rapidly. Uh, and uh, if we want to do the preparedness, part of the preparedness is to make sure that we have the proper maps, the proper studies of what ha existed in that. And it's uh, all, most of it, available in libraries on the web. So we have to get that in our, on our shelf rapidly. And we have to, to run scenarios. We have to, ha to do, do training with uh, our staff, uh, uh, with some mayors and some, we have to, we have to do those, 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 um, those drills to get uh, uh, ourselves ready. Those drills have, of course, to take place in the field. And maybe the last of last, uh, we have this famous making city resilient, make my city resilient campaign of, of UN Habitat. I think one of the uh, most useful elements on that, and I'm turning to Sam, first aid course. So many people die in disaster or conflict in cities because there is no culture of first aid. And it's sometimes just so simple. So massive impregnation of the first aid reflex in urban settings will go a long way to save and, and alleviate suffering. Thanks, Francois. I'm going to turn over to Sam now. And Sam, there was a question uh, directed to you by now from University of Oxford about um, markets. Yeah. And you might also want to comment on Anna's comment. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just quickly mention, um, coming on what uh, Kate was saying, I, th I think Francois is absolutely right. The, the things that may be considered very basic, like first aid, are really core to, to what we're doing. So in, uh, in Kathmandu, in, in the community-based uh, disaster risk reduction component, this flagship of, of the Nepal Risk Reduction Consortium, that is really central, and it's really about working with... Uh, the communities themselves that are affected by such disasters and are going to be the first responders and training in first aid, search and rescue, uh, and so on. And it may be not as technically complex as some of the specialists in search and rescue, but they're going to be the first people there. So I think that's, that's important to say. Um, but then coming back to this, this point on partnerships, I think it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely essential. In terms of building resilience, I think one of the key things for me is that Certainly, as, as the Red Cross and as national societies, we can only contribute to a wider picture. And I think that's why the consortium in, in Nepal, although it's a bit of an artificial model and it's not uh, perhaps so 
uh, organic or spontaneous. It really is br harnessing different capacities of different agencies within the different flagships and, and bringing in some of those skills which would be outside the humanitarian sector. Um, and in terms of satellite imagery, for example, we are using that. I mean, I remember I was, I was working with uh, Oxfam when the, the Haiti earthquake, and I was just in, in Oxford, and they were sending in all the pictures of the satellite, the, you know, the Google photos of the golf courses filling up. Um, and now we've got, we've got these uh, satellite imagery we're using uh, for our work, for our preparedness work in Kathmandu. So at least there is a shift to uh, doing more in preparedness and drawing on these skills. I know lots is being done around um, engagement with risk information, and uh, that's something you're in involved with. So I, th I think that's, that's really positive. Um, in terms of markets and, and tools, we're, we're just developing a new tool with uh, with ICRC to have a bit of a, uh, a more rapid assessment of markets, and I think that's quite important. Uh, we're also working with the American Red Cross. That's just being finalised to, to like the emergent uh, market mapping and assessment, the EMMA uh, tool. It's a, it's a bit more of a kind of quick and dirty approach, but I think that's, that's interesting in understanding uh, markets and how they're changing. But also, in, in the next phase of this work, we want to look at what we're doing in Port-au-Prince and how uh, we can understand economic recovery more broadly, not just looking at asset-based transfers, but also you know, what we're doing within an integrated approach. And if we're building houses, what's the impact on that? And we built a canal down through the middle of the community, which may be considered a wash intervention, but now you've got, uh, because it's a cap canal, you've got market traders going off on top of that. So how, how can the infrastructural elements contribute to, to economic recovery? And I think we need to move out of our kind of asset focused livelihoods approaches and look at the the policies institutions and processes what Francois talked about some of the history and how that affects livelihoods while saying that's a very challenging area for humanitarians to engage with um, and the final point about yeah I mean there's there's certainly lots of learning across the Red Cross I think in Latin America there's also been a study uh, done by the Federation they're setting up their own um, uh, risk and, and resilience uh, urban units uh, based in, in Panama that's going to look at some of these issues. So I think we really do need to be doing the, the, the cross-context uh, learning. But of course these contexts are very different and we can identify some overarching principles for how we may engage, but uh, you know, the, the context analysis and the assessment and you know, the going back and doing the kind of due diligence in terms of understanding the genesis of the city and, and its historical context, as Francois has highlighted, is really important. Thank you very much. We're nearly out of time, but um, we do have two questions from our online audience. So if you're willing to bear with us for maybe five more minutes, um, we can incorporate those. So th those of you who have to leave, I understand, but it's, uh, it's only just gone uh, 2.30. So let's give uh, the question from Barry Armstrong who's in the UK, formerly with OCHA and the British Red Cross. And, um, sorry, I'm a bit visually challenged here. Barry says, thanks to all three presenters for very interesting discussions. A question to Sam. You made reference to reconfiguring coordination around the local area rather than a cluster approach. Do you see this as an either or option? Or do you see a halfway whereby somehow the cluster system can be decentralized and adapted to be to better support local norms and local challenges. I don't know if you got that sound, but you can yeah. read it. <laughs> and then the second question is from Mike Meany from Habitat for Humanity. Um, he says, given the scale of affected populations within an urban context, Habitat for Humanity is looking at enabling approaches for shelter and settlements rather than just the provision of actual product. This affects the normal humanitarian timing, stroke output, stroke impact measures, which are used by donors and other agencies. I mean, how will donors agencies need to adapt to enabling scaled approaches in the future? And I think with that, maybe Sam, if you want to address the first question and uh, others can come in, and then maybe Elena could uh, address the second one to begin with, and then you can come in. Um, in, in terms of the coordination question, I mean, I won't sort of open up the whole issue of, of humanitarian form and the, you know, the, the benefits and, and downfalls of, of the cluster system. I think a lot has been achieved through it. 
decentralizing, I think, is really important, and um, but it, it's also a challenge about how much agencies can actually commit to engage with the cluster system. And I worked in uh, South Sudan, and there was always discussions at the Juba level of, oh, who's going to take on responsibility for the state level coordination and working with when everyone looked at their shoes and didn't engage. So I think that's a responsibility of agencies to really take that up. I think decentralizing uh, is is important. Looking at geographies, but when we go to these small neighborhoods we're working in, um, it, it's, it's about also not just coordination, but integrating our own programs. Because all too often you can have too strong a technical specialism within one agency and you're not even joined up within your own programming. So if we could get our own houses in order as agencies first and then, uh, and then see how we could, we could work together to improve the system, I think that would be a good starting point. Great. Francois? Yes, uh, it's interesting your question because we raised it when we did the Cluster 2 evaluation a couple of years ago and it came again strongly during the uh, IT evaluation and the Philippine evaluation. At, at the municipal level, you need to have multi-sectorial coordination under the mayor. And then you might have small groups of people working with the water services, with the education services, with the health services. But things that would not be under the cluster, it would be under services and coordinated by the municipal structure. Where you need the cluster is probably more at the national level, where the cluster would be there to determine, determine the, the, uh, the strategy, the, uh, the key indicators, the, uh, the, the overall criteria, linking link to, the, to the ministries in charge, to the line ministries. The problem at this stage is that the inter-cluster inter system is at the top of everything. While what we need at the field is multi-sectorial area-based coordination, so it's not an either-or. Is where do we need what? And, and it's we feel that, and the experience in the field is that when you have a good inter-sectorial coordination at the municipal level, you get much more effective, less time spent in, in uh, meetings, etc. Coordination and more integration with the national, uh, with the municipal system. And then you can have the cluster system at the, at the national level with the line ministries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elena, this question about um, enabling approaches for shelter and settlements. Can you address that? I'm not really na an expert in shelter, but I can, I can talk a little bit about the, the health sector. Um, this is, uh, I think, when I was discussing about uh, working in partnership and uh, developing uh, more networking with uh, civil society organizations, community leaders, uh, local NGOs and local authorities, it's I think this is part of that, that process, uh, in particularly in the, in the part that relates to um, partnership as well as capacity building. Uh, for uh, health sector or uh, yeah, health uh, or medical uh, organizations, this might be really the integration with the Minister of Health and trying to train staff that is then able to uh, uh, to do um, their work independently within the community. In particular, there has been some attempts um, to look at uh, and, and train uh, community health workers to identify, for example, signs of dangers during pregnancy or certain uh, certain diseases so that they can either uh, refer to the nearest health structure or for the most basic stuff they can train themselves so they can uh, treat themselves so this is building somehow the capacity and the resilience of the of the organization but for, for shelter I cannot answer because I haven't done any work on that <laughs> no that's fine um, any final comments Francois and Sam and then we'll wrap up yeah, maybe on that shelter story, it's interesting because uh, if we look at, uh, at again, the response to, to the uh, earthquake in, 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 in AT, for the first three months, you had all kind of experts, the most sophisticated experts on, on shelter, were scratching their head by inside and by outside, trying to find the most uh, cyclone resilient. Uh, and at the end, uh, they produce things which has only one door. In the in the Asian culture, a house has always two doors, often three doors. So they spend all the energy on the wrong question. And I think we have to uh, to to look to to change a bit some of the paradigm. What counts is not the resistance of this transitory shelter. What counts is how quick we can move from the tarpaulin to a 
something that would lead to a normal house. And we spend, I think, too much time in trying to design what is the best transitory shelter, uh, and we concentrate on technical issues, while a house is not just a roof on four walls. It's a place where people live. If you go on our website, we, make, we have a small movie called From the Box, Where to Sleep, to the Place, Where to Live. And, and I think people, are, so we have to change the, some of the paradigm. Uh, we still focus too much on the roof. And of course the roof is important. But uh, a pl uh, even a transitory house, even a tarpaulin, is just not a place to protect your head. It's a place where you live. And we have to make sure that what we do help people to develop that life, not only to be protected ag against the sun and, and, and the rain, but a place where they can redevelop their life. And this is a change of paradigm I think we need to do on that. Thank you, Francois. Sam, last word. No, I, I just really echo those comments, uh, Francois said. I think, you know, while we can talk a lot about this sort of high tech of, of, of humanitarian assistance, I think it, this is ultimately about responding to need and, and vulnerability and ensuring dignity in, in the solutions that we we provide, whether that's adequate shelter, whether that's the, the choice that's associated with, with cash-based responses. So I think, you know, accountability and, and how we're working with the communities that we in, engage with should really remain central. And that's something we've done in terms of where we're placing our actual offices to try and be right in the heart of the community uh, in Port-au-Prince, for example. That brings stress for the, the people that are working there. But I think it it comes to, to deal with some of these issues like these fortified aid compounds Mark Duffield's talked about, people have written about, that we're not creating those. We are working with the people that we're trying to help to, to help them build back. So that would be my final thought. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience here in London and also online for attending today. And a special thanks to our panelists, Francois Grinwald, Sam Carpenter and Elena Lucci for a very interesting session. Thank you very much. And do read the report.